Okay, guys and gals, <clears throat> this particular lesson will be covering the Great Pyramid of Giza in Egypt. Um, <clears throat> there'll be several resources we'll, that I've used to compile this stuff. We're not going to be reading too much from these books today. Uh, I'll just be going over the information and we can read from these books at a later date. Um, I'll be using Pyramidology, Adam Rutherford's collection, a four-volume set, which is one you're looking at here. This is off of that. Um, I pull out some facts from Zechariah Sitkin's Stairway to Heaven, some stuff from the Orion Mystery by Bouval, a little bit from Fingerprints of the Gods. Of the gods, excuse me. Um, we'll get into this book, which is a real awesome book. We'll get into it in detail later date. Uh, Secrets of the Great Pyramids, Peter Tompkins. Great Pyramid Decoded by Le Masurier. Great Pyramid Decoded by Raymond Capt. It's a pretty good book. <clears throat> the problem with all these books, and anybody that's written a book on Pyramid, the earlier books, um, their dating is not <clears throat> exactly refined. And the timeline, the uh, Rutherford's got the most revised dating. However, even with Rutherford and, and those uh, older ones since him, the problem with a lot of these books is, is they tend to go off on their own little tangent <clears throat> and sometimes predict dates for the Lord's return, which has not happened. Uh, well, the problem isn't that the Great Pyramid is full of crap. The problem is these people are predicting things that the Great Pyramid doesn't necessarily say. So... People wind up turning off on the whole idea of uh, research into the pyramid, um, but you don't have to. Just because someone predicts something that doesn't come to pass doesn't mean you should throw out the baby with the bathwater, per se. Uh, there's a lot of really cool information here, uh, facts about this great pyramid that'll just blow you away. <clears throat> First, right now, I'm going to read a paragraph from Adam Rutherford's first book. He says, uh, Pyramidology is the science which uh, coordinates, combines, and unifies science and religion, and is thus the meeting place of the two. When the Great Pyramid is properly understood and universally studied, false religions and erroneous scientific theories will alike vanish and true religion and true science will be demonstrated to be harmonious. Um, <clears throat> a true scientist, when he learns new truths, will um, impart those truths into his whole being. And if he has to revise some of his current theories and some of his current thinking on things, then he just has to. If there's a new truth you've learned, then if, if it's the actual truth, then that should all be incorporated into your, your body of knowledge. Um, <clears throat> the Great Pyramid on the Giza Plateau in Egypt has been the uh, object of uh, scientific and archaeological study in this modern era um, of knowledge, of, of the, the growth of knowledge the last couple hundred years. Uh, it is the most measured monument uh, and studied monument in the world. It is the last of the seven ancient wonders of the world and is the only one remaining. If you take a closer look at it though, you will find a lot of amazing evidence uh, regarding the construction ability of the ancients that built this thing. Whoever built it had to have a superior knowledge of construction techniques that far surpasses what we have now. Uh, as well as there are many examples in the construction that a superior knowledge of the universe and of the earth 
the dimensions of the Earth, and the solar system are all incorporated into the building and its measurements. The Great Pyramid is singled out from, the, from all other pyramids. There is none like it. Uh, it is the oldest. Now, the Egyptians won't tell you that, but I can prove that it is, and I will go over that shortly. Uh, and by the, the superior construction techniques that it possesses uh, in relation to all other Egyptian pyramids, and I'm talking about the three Giza pyramids on the Giza Plateau in relation to all the other pyramids in Egypt, uh, they just so far surpass uh, any other pyramid. It makes it obvious, or seems obvious, that the Egyptians didn't build it. They tried to imitate it, but they were never able to come close. Um, whoever built it, as you will see in a little bit, had to have some divine help in planning. <clears throat> and this study will prove to you <clears throat> the divine inspiration behind the building of the Great Pyramid <clears throat> and also will correct what the Egyptians say about it. Now, the Egyptians don't want to... Uh, give up this monument. They want to claim ownership of it. They want to claim that they built it, the the three monuments on the Giza Plateau, uh, the three pyramids. Now they built uh, other things around it, um, but they, they do not want to give up ownership of this pyramid. And I can understand, it's the Great Pyramid. Um, but once we're through with this, you'll realize that they not only need to give up the ownership of that Great Pyramid, but the second and third pyramid as well uh, on the Giza Plateau, as well as the Sphinx. Um, all of these um, predate any uh, dynasties uh, in Egypt. So, all right, Currently, the Egyptians say that the Pharaoh Cheops, or Khufu, built it. Because inside one of the relieving chambers, or a few of the relieving chambers, above the king's, uh, the king's chamber, there was found a cartouche, or a king's signature symbol. Uh, all the pyramids in Egypt are covered with writings, hieroglyphics, paintings, uh, filled with gold and statues, um, all except for one. The Great Pyramid is silent in this respect. There has never been anybody feel, uh, found in it, no mummies. There has never been any markings, any kind of hieroglyphic writings, Besides these car, these um, what they they call uh, quarry marks, um, and we'll discover uh, a little bit that these were all forged. Um, so the Great Pyramid is totally silent as far as any kind of of writings or any kind of gold or or mummies or anything that was found in it. There was nothing in it. There's never been anything found in it. Now. The cartouche and the quarry marks uh, above the king's chamber have uh, been proven to have been a forgery. Zechariah Sitkin proved it in his um, book, The Stairway to Heaven. He shows how that there was a, a book published called the Materia Hieroglyphica. It was published some nine years, I think, before the discovery of these quarry marks. Now, the, the man that found these marks, the discoverer, was Colonel Howard Weiss. He was at the end of his expedition, and money was running out. He hadn't found any treasure, writings, anything in the Great Pyramid. Now, in the publication by Mr. Wilkinson, the Materia Hieroglyphica, there was a cartouche similar to the one found in Wellington's chamber over the king's chamber. Now, just because there was the, a similar cartouche found, that doesn't prove uh, that it was a forgery. However, uh, Mr. Wilkinson, who made the book, uh, there was a mistake in his cartouche in the book. And that same mistake was incorporated into the one that Colonel Weiss had forged. Uh, the symbol O, used correctly in Khufu's name, was etched with diagonal lines inside of it. Uh, several lines etched inside of it. 
the plain O, or the O with a dot in the middle, was a symbol, uh, a sacred symbol of God, and it was very sacred to the Egyptians. It would not have, uh, an era like that would not have been incorporated into this uh, Pharaoh's signature. Um, anyone that did that, it would probably would have cost him his life. Now, just after Colonel Weiss's discovery, the amended publication was released that corrected not only that symbol, but many other ones that were incorrectly painted under the walls of the chambers over the king's chamber. Um, now, Herodotus, the father of history, said that Cheops was not buried there, but in an obscure place. There's never been a body in the Great Pyramid. Uh, Manithos, an Egyptian priest, indicates that he was not there. Uh, he was buried elsewhere. Now, there's other things besides that, that uh, specific error that proves that there's a forgery. Um, when it was first found, a uh, Mr. Birch um, was, was brought in to... Uh, look at the marks by Howard Weiss and to authenticate them. Let's see. It says the symbols or hieroglyphs traced in red by the sculptor or mason upon the stones of the chambers of the Great Pyramid are apparently quarry marks. He observed in his opening paragraph the qualification that once followed although not very legible owing to their having been written in a semi hieratic or linear hier hieroglyphic characters, characters, they possess points of considerable interest. What puzzled Mr. Birch was that the markings, presumably beginning of the fourth dynasty, were made in a script that started to appear only centuries later. Uh, so, not only did he make an error in the spelling of Howard Weiss's cartouche he also used a script that was uh, not being used in the fourth dynasty but came to be used several centuries later also interesting um, is that there are other kings uh, <clears throat> king signatures in in the areas above the the cartouche of Khufu in the in the relieving chambers above that that were from kings that were of an earlier time so it's it's very unusual that this earlier king would have put his signature higher up in the pyramid than than uh, Khufu did several things were were proved this uh, Colonel Vice's mistake now interesting also is the fact that. The, the marks appear on three of the four walls. Uh, and good old Colonel Weiss just happened to break into the wall with no writing on it. Um, so anyway, the, it's obvious that, that these are forged. It's also, which, which strange is, because of this discovery, current Egypt, Egypt uh, uh, the Egypt thinking has it that the uh, that that's just a fact that that this is Khufu's pyramid that Cheops built it, and even later there was a what's called an inventory stella, a uh, rock with hieroglyphic writings on it that um, also indicates that during Khufu's reign that the Great Pyramid was already here, um, and yet now Egypt the Egyptologist will say that that was a forgery. Um, you know, why don't they just look at the, the truth and and realize that Khufu didn't build this thing. So anyway, many things prove it's a forgery. Uh, we can get past that. Egypt, uh, Khufu did not build this thing. Now, Another thing that I want you to understand um, pyramids do not need air passages, and yet there are two air passages coming out of the king's chamber, uh, going all the way to the exterior. 
uh, and air would only do uh, would be detrimental to a mummy uh, many many things here that we find that it just proves that this was not built as a tomb for a pharaoh now before we get into the uh, spiritual and prophetical side of this <clears throat> I want to give you some of the scientific uh, perfection and measurements that are built throughout this whole pyramid um, So these um, Stone Age men carrying their stone axes built this wonderful mo uh, monument. So let's just look at what they were able to do with their primitive tools and their their knowledge. Let me get this out of the way. Now the Great Pyramid. was placed not only at the exact center of the Nile Delta Quadrant, but it's also placed at the exact center of all the land mass of the Earth. Now, the Great Pyramid sits here. Its diagonal lines totally encompass the Nile Delta Quadrant. Now this is called Lower Egypt up here. This is called Upper Egypt here. It's kind of backwards from what you normally think. Um, so when someone's talking about Upper Egypt, they're talking about South Egypt. And when they're talking about Lower Egypt, they're talking about North Egypt. Now here's a, an example of the, how the pyramid was placed at the center of the landmass of the whole world. Now if you dial, uh, draw diagonal lines, uh, a line vertical through the pyramid and a line horizontal through the pyramid, it touches the most land mass of anywhere else you could put a line. There's nowhere else you can put a vertical line uh, that'll touch the most land mass as well as a horizontal line. Um, this would be the most perfect place to put your Greenwich, um, uh, your mean Greenwich time. This should be the, the spot on earth that we divide our time with. Now, so it provides the longest land meridian and the longest land parallel. This great pyramid is aligned with true north. Now true north is a point out in space. It is not magnetic north. Our closest achievement to that alignment is the Paris Observatory. It is six minutes of a degree off of true north. The great pyramid is only three minutes of degree off and that was proven to be the result of uh, land subsidence or, or shifting of the land and not by an error of the builders. True North is what happens when you take this earth as it's spinning on its axis. This earth spins and you take the, the South Pole to the North Pole and you draw a line out into space. Right now it points to Polaris. That's what we call the North Star. It's the star nearest the actual axis of the Earth. And, uh, most stars do not actually line up exactly with this axis, but it gets close and so we call Polaris right now the North Star. Now is this Earth turning in space? It tends to wobble like a top. This 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 earth as it's spinning, just like a top starts to slow down, it tends to start wobbling very slowly. There's what's called the precession of the equinoxes. It's a 26,000 year cycle in which as this earth wobbles, that point uh, out in space, the north, uh, the true north point changes so that the pole star over a period of time would change to something else. It would change in this cycle. Right now it's Polaris. Back in 2800 BC it was Alpha Draconis. We'll talk about him later. Uh, and, and on you go around this cycle. So there's um, uh, 
the fact that precession of the equinoxes uh, is actually built into the pyramid and we'll show that in a second um, this is pretty amazing now on the vernal equinox let me find another picture here Now the vernal equinox in the year 2141 BC, Alfred de Cronus was the North Star at that time, the Dragon Star, uh, Thuban. Thuban means subtle. But this North Star at the time, the Dragon Star, would shine directly all the way down this descending passage. So that if you were standing at the bottom with a mirror, you would see the reflection from that star's light. Now this is the only star that's ever shown all the way down this passage. Uh, it's almost impossible to get that alignment uh, accurate, but, it, but they did it. So we know for sure that in 2141 BC, Alfred Aconis would uh, lined up with this descending passage. Now this Aphrodiconus represents the devil, and this represents mankind's descent under the influence of Satan. Um, now, we'll get into more details about that in a minute. There's a basic unit of measure in the Great Pyramid, which is called the sacred or the pyramid inch. Now the Pyramid inch and I'll, I'll show you where we can find that in the pyramid in, in a little bit but the pyramid inch is if you take the axis from the north to the south pole and you divide that into 500,000 units you come up with what's called the sacred or the pyramid inch now in the French Revolution they come up with a brilliant idea of the metric system and they decided that they would take the circumference of the outside circumference of the uh, globe from pole to equator and divide it up and give themselves the meters. The problem with that is depending on where you measure on the globe that's always going to change. That will never be consistent. The only true consistent measuring unit would be then the sacred inch or pyramid inch because this axis of the earth does not change it will stay consistently uh, and it, depending you're not going to measure it in any other place but straight through the earth so it's more consistent than the the meter the meter is not a uh, a good way to um, use this now uh, the same inch which is in, embodies what's called the sacred cubits in, in Scripture. If you look in Scripture and, and where it tells you they use cubits, they're talking about the sacred cubit, and that's 25 sacred inches or pyramid inches. The same sacred cubit is used in uh, Noah's Ark, the Ark of the Covenant, Solomon's Temple, and then in the New Jerusalem, but also it's used in Stonehenge. The, what's strange about this same sacred inch, it is only a half a hair's breadth different than the English and American inch. You take your hair out of your head and you split it in a half. There's your difference between our inch, our current inch, and the sacred or pyramid inch. Uh, so it was preserved and went to England. They used it. It was built, uh, whoever built Stonehenge, which I believe Enoch was probably responsible for, just as he was probably responsible for the design or the building of the Great Pyramid. But we'll get into that in a minute. Now, on this Great Pyramid, I want to show you some 
casing stones. Now this is the base of the pyramid. There were some 144,000 of these dense white marble-like limestone blocks used as casing stones originally on the Great Pyramid. Uh, they weigh from 16 to 20 tons apiece. They are finished so perfectly that there is a variance of no more than one one hundredth of an inch across the plane, some at 35 square feet. So you got a five by square, a five by seven square block, 35 square feet, and on that whole plane, there is no more variance than one one hundredth of an inch. Now the joints between each block. Uh, there is no greater variance than one fiftieth of an inch between each block. You cannot even get a credit card in between the space between these blocks. Uh, it, is, it just blows you away. How could they do that? How could they move these giant blocks, uh, 16 to 20 tons a piece, uh, finish them so perfectly? So op uh, The work is, can be compared to optician's work. It is so perfect. Uh, and then glue these blocks together. That's what's, what's what blows you away. The, the joints have been poured with the cement covering the whole plane. Uh, and it is, the cement is of such a tenacity that the limestone blocks will break before the cement gives. Um, how they finish them with opticians' uh, tolerances uh, how they glued them together, how they moved them, uh, and placed them so accurately uh, with a small tolerance there are still baffles the experts today. We could not duplicate the feet today. Now, the core masonry, let's see if I can find another good picture here. Here's your sockets. We'll talk about the sockets in a minute. Okay, I don't have any good pictures here. The core masonry, well I do, but I just gotta find them. We'll look at this one. Here's an overview, uh, overhead view of the Giza complex. The coarse limestone blocks that remain in here, there was some 2,300,000 of these coarse limestone blocks that make up the core masonry. And these blocks weigh about two and a half tons a piece. Now, <coughs> Herodotus uh, stated that strangers to Egypt supervised the building of the Great Pyramid and that the temples of Egypt were closed during the construction. Also that during the, the building process, Egypt suffered all kinds of calamities. Now the Egyptian priest Manetho states that the temples of Egypt were closed during the time of the visitation of the shepherd kings. These shepherd kings, they came and subdued Egypt without a fight. They were men of an ignoble race and had the confidence to enter Egypt and easily subdue it with their power. God is behind the building of the Great Pyramid. He sent, uh, sent these shepherd kings, the divine architects, probably with Enoch at the head of them, maybe using watchers uh, as his uh, construction crew. Don't know about that, but we'll, that's possible. Uh, and he had divine plans. He built that great structure before um, and before we're finished with this particular study, you'll agree. The Egyptians always hate shepherds. Uh, in light of this knowledge, it's understandable because these shepherd kings came in and, and took over Egypt without even a fight. Now, the Great Pyramid covers over 13 acres. Contains nearly 90 million cubic feet of masonry, enough to build 30 Empire State Buildings. The original side width is 70, 755 and 3 quarter feet, and the original height is 454 and a half feet, where it's unfinished at the top. 
it, uh, with the capstone, if it had been placed, it would be at 485 feet tall, equal to a 48-story uh, skyscraper. The top capstone was never set on the Great Pyramid uh, because they did not build it to its proper specs. On each corner of the Great Pyramid, I showed you a second ago, there are some sockets very on the very outside of each corner. And this is a modern construction technique that helps to stabilize the building. And if and it shows the original plans of the architect. If they had built this pyramid out properly to the full uh, to the sockets where it was supposed to have gone, then this pyramid would be wider and taller. However, God knew they weren't going to do that, and in doing so all this opens up and we see some pretty awesome mathematical uh, uh, information that we would never have known had they built it properly so God had them build it slightly smaller not to full scale the capstone would not fit the the chief cornerstone um, as a matter of fact the only chief cornerstone is the top of a pyramid a because it actually touches all four sides so that's called a chief cornerstone, but it would not fit. And Jesus is that chief cornerstone that the builders rejected. Now, um, originally, with its limestone casings on it, brilliant white, shining in the sun, uh, it, it was said to it would have been seen from the moon as a bright star on the earth. Uh, it also would made a, made a perfect sundial because the great rays of light reflecting off of these polished white limestone casings uh, would have been beaming out these these rays uh, across the, the plateau. And as the sun moved, then these rays would, would change and it would give you a perfect um, timepiece, uh, creating a great cross on the Nile Delta. Now... There are some other interesting facts I want to go over with you before we get into some some more deep stuff. The the distance from the sun from the earth to the sun is built into the pyramid's base plans and it was built in at estimating at 92 million miles. Uh, built into the pyramid is the mean density of the earth. Uh, most Current tests have it at 5.672 times the weight of water at 68 degrees Fahrenheit. The pyramid puts it at 5.7. And that's the main density of all the, the content within the Great Pyramid. Uh, the weight of the Earth. Um, at approximately... Wow, it's a big number. 5... 0 0.300000 tons and the weight of the pyramid is 5,300,000 tons so it's proportionally related to each other the volume of the earth's crust above sea level is approximated at 455 feet the the earth's crust above mean sea level yes close to the 454 and a half feet that the builders, the builders left it unfinished the mean ocean level of the earth using geometry and the figure of 3652.42 which is proportionally related to the solar year and the base circuit of this pyramid which I'll show you in a little bit gives a result slightly over 193 feet 7 inches the approximations now place the mean ocean level at 193 feet 7 inches the mean temperature of the earth is about 68 degrees Fahrenheit in the pyramid, this temperature is maintained permanently and unvaryingly in the inner chambers by the air channels. The uh, channels from the king's chamber go out all the way to the outside of this pyramid. And when cleared, now the, uh, when these were cleared and allowed ventilation to come through, this pyramid kept that same temperature year round. Uh, interestingly, too, if it was just for air uh, ventilation, uh, they would have made these uh, 
ventilation ducts straight out and not made it so hard by going clear up through the courses of masonry. But they didn't. They ran up through the courses of masonry, and that was to show us something else. Yeah, they were used as ventilation uh, ducts, but it also is teaching us something else about the stars, and we'll get into that. <clears throat> the rotundity of the earth, the curvature of the earth. The sides of the core masonry recede 35.76 inches on each side in the center. If you look here at the Great Pyramid, it's got a concavity of each side. It goes in just a little bit. And I'm going to show you in just a second about that and what that gives us. But because it, it's, it curves in on each side, 35.76 inches in the middle, and that's this is a bit exaggerated, but... Um, if you uh, make a curved line produced by that and computing the radius that it would take to make a circle, the same radius is approximately half the diameter of the Earth. Now, the whoever built this knows about pi, 3.14. It is directly related to the base circumference versus the height. So the base versus the height gives you pi and or it's half pi, one half of pi, which means that the Great Pyramid in, in pyramid form is a type of the upper hemisphere of the Earth. It's um, because it represents pi, we know that pi gives us the uh, circumference of a circle uh, in comparison to the diameter. And with this being like considered the radius because it's only half so two times the radius or two times the height of the pyramid equals pi this outer circumference it's amazing how did they know pi existed back then we just figured this stuff out um, so the pyramid is a rep representation of the northern hemisphere in pyramidal form now how did these early Egyptians know that stuff how did they know about pi how did they know um, about all this stuff. It just blows you away. And I'm going to tell you, the Egyptians didn't know. Somebody else did and came in and did it. Now, here is an exaggerated form of the, the base of the pyramid. And it's very exaggerated. This is just to give you how it works. Now, the pyramid in its base shows the evidence of the knowledge of all three ways of computing the year. Uh, there are three different ways to compute our years. You have a side reel, the anomalistic, and the solar year. Uh, you can measure them in three different ways. The solar year is 365.24235 days and is when the Earth passes the vernal equinox. The side reel year is 365.25636, and is when the Earth appears to be over the same point in the heavens. And the anomalistic year is 365.25986 days, and is when the Earth is measured closest to the Sun in perihelion. Now, all three ways of measuring the year are embodied in the base length of the pyramid. Since the sides curve in slightly, you can measure it three ways. You can measure this A to B. You can measure it A to E to F to B. And you can measure it A to little b to big B. Now these three different ways of measuring this, because this one here is straight into the center, you can measure that. These three different ways give you, in sacred cubits, the exact length of time in our solar year. A to B, which on the bottom you can go D to C, 365.242 sacred cubits. Uh, the next one, AEFB, 365.256 sacred cubits. And A little bb, 365.259 sacred cubits. This just blows you away. Now, how did these people know? I can understand them knowing that the year is 365 days and maybe even adding a quarter day every four years. I can get that. But how did they know about the 
uh, side reel year and the anomalistic year. Somebody was really, really smart back then. All right, there are many, um, many, many more examples that show the scientific precision uh, of the Great Pyramid. And, and I don't want to get into all that today. We got all these books, and I'll get into that stuff at another time. Now, but what I want to go over with you now is a couple things. And in your Bible, if you go to Isaiah 19. 19 and 20. I guess I should have got my Bible out. Isaiah 19, 19 and 20. There's what's called the Great Pyramid Text of Scripture. Now, the Hebrew letters are also numbers. So, numerology, a biblical numerology or uh, grammatria uh, is is valid. It's been used even by the, the ancients as um, a valid way of, an, of interpreting certain things in Scripture. So, because the Hebrew letters all mean numbers, if you take these two verses, and I'm going to read these two verses to you as soon as I find them. 19, 19 and 20. Okay. <clears throat> Verse 19, In that day shall there be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt and a pillar at the border thereof to the Lord. And it shall be for a sign and for a witness unto the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. For they shall cry unto the Lord because of their oppressors and he shall send them a savior and a great one, and he shall deliver them. Now, if you take those verses, those two verses that says, in the midst of the land of Egypt and at the border thereof. Now, Giza means border. It actually marked the border of upper and lower Egypt. So, it is both in Egypt, in the midst of Egypt, and it is at the border. There's no other place on the earth where this, these verses of the Bible will point to. They're either going to move the Great Pyramid, or this is, in fact, the altar spoken of. Now, there are two different types of altars spoken of in the Bible. You have an altar of sacrifice, and you have an altar of witness. The altar of sacrifice must not have uh, been used hewn stones, so... They had to be just regular stones that you find. You cannot have uh, put tools on them. But an altar of witness, it, it never says anything about that. And that's what this is. And, and the verse tells you it'll be for a sign and for a witness under the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. So, and interestingly, if you take these two texts, these two verses, and you add up the numerical value of all the letters in those two verses, and you add them up all the way down, you come up with a total, 5,449. The height of the Great Pyramid in, in sacred inches, pyramid inches, is 5,449. So that is a type of grammatria, a type of uh, numerology. So you have two verses in Isaiah that point to a certain place on earth, uh, which is where the Great Pyramid sits. You have the values of these two verses come up to 5,449, and you have the Great Pyramid, the total height in sacred inches, 5,449. Is that a coincidence? Well, you know, we'll see. But if it is this altar of witness spoken of, then, then what does it say or witness to? And, and it tells us this uh, in the verses. It says, It shall be a sign and for a witness unto the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. They shall cry unto the Lord because of their oppressors, and he shall send them a Savior and a great one, and he shall deliver them. Now, so it's witnessing an event. It's witnessing a coming Savior. It's witnessing him being sent onto the scene to save us. Uh, and we'll show, I'll show you in a little bit more evidence that proves that. Um, so it witnesses to the Christ. But also, uh, it 
there's a prophetical timeline within the Great Pyramid that tells us the history of the world by marking major events in the Earth's history in a timeline. Um, if you're a little confused by that, don't don't be. We'll you'll understand uh, shortly. Just open your mind and your heart to these truths, and check this stuff out. Now, the ancient Egyptians, the traditions of the ancient Egyptians call it called the Great Pyramid the Pillar of Enoch. Um, <clears throat> Enoch lived, uh, and Enoch's fingerprints are all over it. By the way, it's it. You'll see that in a second. But did you ever wonder why Enoch lived 365 years? Uh, the exact same number of days as in our, our solar year. And actually, if you go to the uh, apocryphal book of Enoch, he lived a total of 365 years, 88 days, and 9 hours. Now, if you divide that up in mathematically, it comes up to 365.242 years. Awesome, ain't it? So what is going on with this? You see, God had it planned that way. He made Enoch live the exact length of our solar year, and then he took him. And the Bible, when it says he took Enoch, it doesn't imply that he took him out to heaven. It implies he took him to another place. Um, and we'll, uh, so where did he take him? And we'll, we'll see all that shortly. Now, what gives you a the fact that Enoch uh, his signatures on this is in this antechamber right here it's called the map room in this map room uh, we can define what's called the Enoch circle now if, if you measured anyone's life you could measure their life in a single line from point A to point B from their birth to their death. Whereas in Enoch's life, Enoch's life cannot be uh, spoken of as a straight line. The only way Enoch's life can be expressed, because it doesn't say he died, the only way Enoch's life can be expressed as far as the years that we know he lived uh, is to create a circle. Now, inside this map room, from wall to wall, if you drew a, a circle in here, it would be exactly 365.242 pyramid inches. So this is a map room. This tells you that for every inch that's designated, it would equal to an, a year of Enoch's life. Now, that gives you a basis, a, 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 a way to measure years uh, in the Great Pyramid because... Uh, one inch of this circle equals uh, this uh, one year of Enoch's life. So as we uh, uh, go further into this, just keep that in mind. Uh, <clears throat> now, since you cannot express uh, him in a, a straight line, his life in a straight line, you have to uh, you have to measure in a circle, and that's how we get this. Now, uh, this map room is the key to interpreting the whole message in the pyramid. One inch, one inch equals one year as in Enix life. Now, you have to have a starting point in order to start calculating dates. You have to have some starting point. Now, I told you earlier about Thuban, about that dragon star, old subtle dragon star out here that at one point, 2141 BC, his light was shining all the way down to the bottom. No other pole star ever did that. Thuban did. Now at the exact same time, we have scored lines here, perpendicular to the descending passage. Now these scored lines are not, uh, do not match the actual lines uh, um, the joints uh, between the uh, core masonry these are actually scored lines perpendicular so they were put there for a reason and I got a picture of Rutherford looking at these scored lines we'll look I'll show you that in a little bit but if you if you look at these scored lines now at that same time that else that uh, Thuban from the dragon constellation uh, the North Star at the time would shine all the way down these scored lines 
lined up with Alcyon within the Pleiades. Now Alcyon means center. So it's a center, a point, a starting point. Um, and if you went one year on either side, if you went to 2142, uh, Thuban wouldn't line up, Alcyon wouldn't line up. If you went to 2140, Thuban wouldn't line up, Alcyon lined up. But on the vernal equinox of 2141 BC, we know that both of these lined up. That gives you a starting point and a date, a date to go by as a beginning reference that you can start calculating uh, within this pyramid. Now, um, <clears throat> so you have uh, the path of the world under the influence of Satan, but you also have Alcyon and the Pleiades. Now, Alcyon and the, the Pleiades are representative of the church, and they're they're seated in the the shoulders of Taurus the bull. So this represents, although we are under the influence of Thuban, the, the uh, great red dragon, Satan, uh, there, however, the called ones of God are safe uh, between the uh, shoulders of Taurus the bull. But, and then we got more things to deal with these, uh, these ventilation shafts or these other shafts that are in there. They're not, all of them are not ventilation shafts and they're not only ventilation shafts. Um, okay, now so if you have a start line, a starting point to measure time, you know one inch equals a year as in Enoch's life found in this map room. Uh, the most logical way to measure time would be on the floor uh, where you walk. The let me see if I can focus this a little better. Okay. So if you take a step and, and you're bent over, this passage and the first ascending passage, you're bent over. You cannot stand up straight. So we're bent, we're bent over under the domination, um, of the authority of Satan that's running this world. But if we have a, a date line to start, we know this lineup occurred 2141 BC, we can start counting the inches, one inch equals a year, all the way down this path. And then you measure where you walk. You don't measure up half, you know, in the air, or on the ceiling, or anything like that. You measure your path, your walk. Um, so it's made of stone, it's non-elastic. So the dates are accurate, an inch is an inch, no more or less. Going back up the passage to the opening, you come up uh, 482 inches to the opening with at a date at 2623 BC, which is a possible date of the, the building of the pyramid. I, I'm not so sure about that. I think that, you know, at least the whole Giza complex uh, was designed back some 10,500 years ago, or by 10,500 BC, but we'll get into that in a minute. So I don't, yeah, this date may not necessarily mean the creation of the, the Great Pyramid, but it's a, that's the date that you get to begin with. Now, if you go on down and you mark an inch to a year, you'll go down the passage 688 inches and you'll get to a place where Okay, now, walking down this descending passage in inches a year, you cut, you'll go down 688 inches. You'll get to where the floor line of this first ascending passage intersects the floor line of the descending passage, and that marks a date at 1453 B.C. Now, uh, it is now known that the Israelites exodus out of Egypt 
occurred around 1453 BC. And I would uh, venture to guess the pyramid's accurate in that date. Uh, we're just getting close closer to that date in our own reckoning. Um, interestingly, there are three granite plugs uh, blocking this ascending passage. Um, <clears throat> And that indicates there had to be a miraculous deliverance, a miraculous way of getting past this. Now, under the law, the Israelites are, are bent over. They're, 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 it's, it's, the Egyptians call this the hall, the double hall of truth. Here they, they call it the hall of truth and darkness. This one they call the hall of truth and light. And we'll explain all that in a minute but this is a type of Israelites under the law right here now if you go on down you keep walking down this descending passage you come up to where it breaks off at the bottom in a date of 1521 now this is when Martin Luther started the uh, Protestant Reformation bringing us back to grace. Now in this pyramid, the descending passage is not exactly centered over the peak of the pyramid. It is off left. It is 286.1 inches left. Now in Latin, left means sinister. Uh, so the descent of mankind is off track. It's off to the left just a little bit. Um, so anytime you go up, uh, in the pyramid you go towards God anytime you go right you go towards God anytime you go down it's away from God and left is away from God uh, that's something that's uh, consistent throughout this whole thing um, let's see now uh, going up the ascending passage once you get past this miraculous deliverance of the Egypt uh, through Egypt where the Israelites were exodus out of Egypt you come up to a date where the Grand Gallery breaks forth. And if you drop a, a rum line straight down from there, that, that marks a date in the spring of AD 33, representing the uh, death and, and resurrection of our Lord. And there's more dates that we'll get into also in, in a minute. Um, but at April 3rd, 33 AD, is is that which would have been the date of the crucifixion and then the uh, subsequent resurrection of our Lord. Now, if you if you look here, I want this queen's chamber has a floor line here. And it has a lower floor line here. Now if you take this lower floor line and you run it out all the way, it intersects a little bit lower than where it breaks up breaks up. And here's a better way to see that. You have let me open this up just a touch. Okay. You have the low floor line of the Queen's Chamber coming out, and it intersects this at a date of September 29th, 2 BC. Uh, then you have, of course, this breaking up north of AD 33, April 3rd. There's also the first floor passage in the Queen's Chamber extended straight out. It winds up creating a second what's called a messianic triangle. This is called a Christ triangle. This is called a lesser messianic triangle. Now this date, AD 46 to AD 58, coincides with Paul and his ministry. Now Paul was called out by Christ. He was taught in the desert for three years uh, after Christ resurrected. Now, you know, going around with Christ for the uh, three some years before uh, he died and was resurrected. He was with all the disciples, and and the disciples um, were had his time. Uh, but yet they had to share time with other disciples. They had to share time with the crowds and all the 
the people that were pushing in uh, in on him. And uh, but Paul, he was tutored by Jesus in the desert for three years. So you have a one-on-one -on -one individual study with the Lord. Now that would be so awesome to be to do. But uh, this proves that Paul's ministry is essential to preserving this uh, this gospel of grace. The disciples at that time, for the most part, especially the ones in uh, Jerusalem, were uh, including Christ's brother, who uh, James, who who never actually followed Jesus until after the resurrection, um, and then they made him uh, head of the church at Jerusalem. But there was no evidence whatsoever that he ever followed Jesus until after Jesus raised from the dead. Now, uh, I want to show you this other. They did this a little bit backwards. So you're looking at the ascending passage in a backwards manner. You have the birth of Christ, September 29, 2 BC. Now, at this angle, you can also create a the same length as this 26 uh, this angle this 26 degrees 18 minutes 9.7 seconds um, this is called the Christ angle now this Christ angle is awesome in itself not only does this wind up creating uh, showing where his baptism was almost three and a half years before his crucifixion um, but this Christ angle is is just blows you away itself and here's here's Paul's uh, lesser messianic triangle here but if you take that Christ angle that same Christ angle which is formed by the intersecting lines at his birth and resurrection when you place that angle on the north side of the pyramid and run that uh, line up towards the northeast it crosses the Red Sea at the Sea of Reeds uh, where Israelites probably crossed it hits Bethlehem on the dot and it crosses the Jericho where supposedly Joshua crossed Jericho now another interesting thing about this is <clears throat> there are 2139 pyramid furlongs from Bethlehem to the pyramid now one pyramid furlong equals 8,000 pyramid inches. So, and what makes this interesting, because you think about that number, 2139 pyramid furlongs. If you take the starting point of 2141, which is where the uh, Alcyon and the Pleiades lined up with uh, the Dragon Star on the descending passage, if you take that date and you add 2139 to it, it comes up with 2 BC. So not only do you get, with this Christ angle, you get uh, the location of Christ's birth, but also the time of, timing of Christ's birth uh, at the exact time that it was to happen. It just, uh, it just blows you away. Um, now, as you go on up, As you keep going up past this grand gallery, and this grand gallery represents the church age, um, but you get what's the great step. You get to a great step here, and it's it's in the 1850s, uh, the knowledge explosion. This is where we started learning things. Now, this first low point at the very end is marks the date of the uh, beginning of the this earth into the end times, the world wars. It marks actually the date our first world war started. Um, and then once you start getting into the king's chamber, that's when all these people start setting dates for the Lord's return. So I am not going to go too far into king's chamber because I'm not going to be an idiot and, um, and uh, set a time for the Lord's return when there's nothing uh, set in stone about what the pyramid says. Now, when the Lord does return, then we'll understand exactly. But until then, no man knows the day or the hour. Uh, so I'm not going to venture a guess.
Now, <clears throat> so the, you have both the world wars, the uh, ending of the oppression uh, of the Jews by Turkey, um, and that all happens right, right here at the beginning, uh, entrance into this King's Chamber complex right here. It's just, uh, it's just so amazing. Now, again and again, the Great Pyramid hits major events in the world's history so precisely that it's impossible for all the dates to have been a coincidence. Uh, <clears throat> the King's Chamber is where the confusion begins. The floor goes horizontal. The blocks change to a red granite. And men have been trying to interpret the Lord's return and setting dates that are signified in the King's Chamber. And when the dates pass with no appearing, then all of a sudden, everybody just throws all, out all this research and all the stuff, uh, figuring that uh, you know none of it's valid. When the fact is, it's our only only our interpretation that proves invalid. But what God is showing us is the history of the world, millennia before it happened. Uh, everything is centered on Christ. This whole monument points to Christ. It points to, to us being under the influence of Satan. Um, it points to a miraculous delivery of the, the Israelites. It points to Jesus' uh, birth, death, resurrection, to the glorious uh, freedom of the, the, the church age, the, the hall of truth and light. Um, it, just, it just blows you away, uh, the, the knowledge embodied in this, this great monument. Now, uh, the Great Pyramid is, is most definitely a prophetical monument for a witness to the world in these last days. Uh, <clears throat> now, what I want to do, going back just a little bit, Josephus made a comment that uh, pertains really to the Great Pyramid as well. <coughs> um, <clears throat> he stated that the descendants of Seth, who were uh, of that, who knew that peculiar knowledge of the heavenly bodies and their motions and their measurements, um, knowing that a coming deluge was coming wanted to preserve the knowledge of the ancients they created two monuments one of stone one of brick the one of brick was in Mesopotamia and the stone one was in the land of Syriac which means Egypt um, <coughs> and he said that the one in, of stone in the land of Syriac remained to his day he was speaking of the great pyramid <coughs> Um, once you get into the the Queen's Chamber, it represents a thousand year time period, uh, 10 by 10 sacred cubits. The coffer in the King's Chamber, the empty sarcophagus, they call it, an empty coffin, um, has the same internal volume as the Ark of the Covenant. Also, the king's chamber itself has the same volume as the Holy of Holies in Solomon's temple. Um, and right now, we are, we are entering in the timeline of history. We're about to be entering into this king's chamber. Uh, and this is the type of the marriage of the Lamb and the promise of eternal life. Um, this, is, this is happening right now, people. The fact that Jesus' return is very close. The prophecy, uh, prophecies foretell it, the stars foretell it, the Great Pyramid's foretelling it. Um, don't wait too late. Ask Him in your heart now. The door only stays open so long. Uh, we'll never understand the King's Chamber Complex uh, or to fix a date for the Lord's return because we're not supposed to know. But I believe in the millennium, the Great Pyramid uh, will be that altar of witness. God's I told you so to the people of the golden age of Aquarius, and then we'll understand all the aspects of this great monument. Uh, you, may, you may say, so what? I don't need any proof that God's in control, and, and rightly so. You may not need anything uh, besides the Bible, and, and maybe this isn't for you. Um, 
But you got to think about the kids these days. Uh, there is a generation growing up in secular schools that learn everything and anything except for God and what he has done. So this monument speaks to a scientific generation that can no longer make excuses. They can't say, um, you know, they can say that scripture is, is oh, it's just literature, it's just uh, myths and whatnot. But this is stone, this is math, this is science. They cannot refute uh, the Great Pyramid, the evidence that we have in the Great Pyramid. It just cannot be refuted. So they are totally without excuse. But the kids growing up in schools these days, um, it's, they're, they're wanting to know things about, uh, they're asking questions. And you have these, these shows, for instance, uh, Ancient Aliens and America Unearthed and, and all these shows um, uh, point to the, the fact that there's evidence all over the world of a superior knowledge uh, that some of these ancients had and they were able to, to build things and do things and it just, you know, how could this be? Because, uh, you know, the way science typically um, assures us is that everything has gone on in the same rate in the same time um, you know, we were, we're constantly progressing. There's never been any huge cataclysmic changes hit the earth. Uh, everything's just going on the same way. Mountains get formed and, and slowly erode into the valleys and, and whatnot. But the, the point is, is, is they're on, they're on a, uh, uh, a thought of, they don't even think that there could be an ancient civilizations that are way smarter than us. They don't realize, um, that this world's been through cataclysmic changes in the past, so cataclysmic that uh, our actually dating methods for um, carbon-14 are, are in question because if there was a canopy of water above the earth like the Bible says there was, then the, uh, the sun's rays would have been hindered hitting the earth, which would allow them to live longer in the pre-antediluvian uh, world. It also... Um, also means that before the flood, uh, because the sun rays weren't hitting the earth as it is now, then the rate of carbon-14 would probably deplete at a different rate. So our, our dating method right now is, is uh, questionable. Um, let's see. Now, Stonehenge itself is directly related to the Great Pyramid as well. Uh, not only does Stonehenge embody Pi, uh, does it, in numerology and gramatria, it, it signifies a witness to the Christ. Um, it, it also is directly related to the Great Pyramid in mathematics and geometry. It's, 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 it, it blows you away, and we'll get into Stonehenge at another time. But if you take just two instances, you take the North uh, West Station Stone and the South East Station Stone, and you run a line through it, and you run it straight across the globe, uh, it will hit. It will hit the Great Pyramid right on right on the head. The uh, measurements in Stonehenge are proportional to the New Jerusalem, and uh, and other things. So it's it just blows you away that Stonehenge and the Great Pyramid are directly related. Now. What I want to do is show you what the Egyptians call the uh, what the Egyptians refer to the um, these particular uh, aspects of the Great Pyramid and these particular channels. Now this downward passage the Egyptians call it the descent. And here it is, the descent of mankind under the uh, authority of Satan, under his domain. Uh, they, there's a miraculous ascent. They call that the door of the, the ascent. Uh, and this is called a double hall of truth. You have the hall of truth in darkness. And, and because Christ had not come yet, uh, the Jews were walking in darkness. They, they knew the Messiah would come, but it is, uh, they were walking in darkness. Now we have the Messiah, uh, and we're in the hall of truth and light. Uh, 
Uh, right now we've been through the passage of the veil, uh, the chamber of the open tomb of the resurrection. This is a type of uh, Christ raised from the dead. And you have the chamber of the new birth of regeneration. This is uh, Part of this is where uh, Jesus actually came in as a, a new birth, a, a God in the flesh coming to save the world. Um, this is called the well of life and the grotto and it also is a type of uh, Christ being the center of the earth uh, and then being blown out in the resurrection up top. Uh, this bottom is called the chamber of the ordeal and that's where this earth will be in some an ordeal there at the end and they, they will be. Um, so even in the Egyptian Book of the Dead, now the Book of the Dead doesn't isn't referring to the dead it's actually only called the book of the dead because it was found in a tomb but it all has to do with uh resurrection with new life with a regeneration of, of our, our, our of us coming back to god uh, so it it speaks of us being under the oppression of satan it, it speaks of us uh finding this truths that are coming out but then finally getting the full truth and light uh, and eventually being resurrected uh, through this. So it's, it, it's very interesting and very thought-provoking how the Egyptian Book of the Dead refers to these passages. Now, in my Dogen speech, I referred to uh, the Dogens worshiping the uh, Sirius B around the star Sirius and and how that kind of relates to the Egyptian mythologies and whatnot. Now, Egypt worships uh, Sirius. They worshiped Orion. Uh, and these things are going to be, can be shown. Now, the air passages that are in the king's chamber, as well as the descending, the uh, descending passage, the, the, top air passage uh, coming north from the king's chamber points exactly to Alpha Deconis just like the descending passage did. Uh, the, south, the, uh, the south air passage from the king's chamber points to Orion's belt, points to the, the big star in Orion's belt, uh, which is also a mirrored image of the Giza complex. I'll show you in a second. The Queen's Chamber, you have two, um, these aren't really ventilation uh, passages because they never went to the outside of the pyramid. They stopped before then. Um, but this first passage points directly to Sirius. And this uh, northern passage uh, coming off the Queen's Chamber points to uh, Ursa Minor. Now. Ursa Minor, if you look here, you got the Little Dipper in the north. Right now, this star at the end, Polaris, it is our pole star. But the star that this is Ursa Minor is pointing to is this one, this, this first one here. Um, so in addition to the descending passage here pointing to Thuban, the air passages point to uh, Ursa Minor and uh, and Thuban, and then the southern air passages point to the Great Pyramid Star and Orion's Belt and to Sirius. Uh, if you get into the Gospel and the Stars just a bit, uh, you find some really interesting scenarios here. First, I want to show you how the Giza Plateau, now this, this Giza complex, if the pyramid itself was not built until 2623, then the layout of this whole complex was completed at an earlier time, probably around 10,400 BC. Uh, due to the procession of the equinoxes, you have at different times in history, the height of Orion changes. Now. Orion in its lowest point 
around 10,400 BC before it actually starts going up again. Uh, this is called the first time. And at this point, and, and it's relation to the Milky Way galaxy going up here. At this point, the actual layout of uh, the three stars in Orion's belt in relation to the three pyramids uh, here in Giza, it is identical. Um, in the Orion mystery, I want to show you something here. Okay, now if you look, these two pyramids, and the diagonals are on them, this smaller third pyramid is off center. It's just off to, the, to one side. It's not lined up exactly with these diagonals. You have a larger pyramid, a smaller pyramid, and an even smaller pyramid. Now in the Orion constellation, you have a larger star, a smaller star and just off to the side the smallest star so this is an exact mirror representation of uh, Orion and the Giza Plateau they're all identical now looking at this again I want you to see uh, a little bit of the gospel and the stars within this. Sirius represents the prince who shall come. Uh, and Jesus is called a Nazarene, Nazarene, and the Nazirius, Nazirene, the S I R means prince, so he is the coming prince. Uh, that's why he's called a Nazarene, not, not just because he grew up in Nazareth but because he is the coming prince. Um, now in Ursa Minor, the star of light right here that's lining up, that's a star called Kochab. And that star means waiting him who cometh. Now Ursa Minor is also uh, the little bear, and you got Ursa Minor, the big bear, or Ursa Major. Uh, the little bear and the big bear are, are rep representative of a sheepfold. Uh, whereas Christ is our, our shepherd, we are the sheep. This is a type of uh, people of the world, the people in Christ. Now, interestingly, uh, and like I say, it's, it's representative of the sheepfold. Now, Alfred Deconus, I told you, meant in Thuban, means subtle. So you have these subtleties of uh, Satan as he deceives the world and his influence on mankind. So you have, uh, now and also I showed you where the Alcyon and the Pleiades, the scored lines go up here and hit Alcyon. And Alcyon means center. So this gives you a centering mark, a, a date line, a, a point to start. Um, but with Ursa Minor, you have uh, a type of, of, our, of the believers of, of God under the influence of Satan coming down and, and going here. But you also have the coming prince. And you have Orion who is uh, crushing the enemy. Uh, the stars are called the three kings here. But these are these are the coming prince and the conquering conquering the enemy. So so in addition to man's descent under Satan, man's man's being drawn uh, into this depths by Satan God providing a way up. God's providing a way up for us through Sirius, through the coming prince, and through Orion crushing uh, the head of Lepus, the hare, which a type of uh, Satan himself. Uh, so it's it just it just kind of blows you the way. The more you get into this thing. Um, so for right now, for the last little bit here, because this is getting a little long. I don't want it to get too long. I want to show you a couple pictures. 
before we finish up, I'm going to show you some pictures. Okay. Here's a, another picture of the Great Pyramid. There's a Great Pyramid at night. Here's one across the Nile. Here you have, let me go to this one first. Here you have, you're looking at from a distance, you've got the Sphinx in the foreground. You got the second pyramid with part of its cap, uh, casing stone still intact in the top and the Great Pyramid here. On this one, this is the north side of the pyramid. Here shows the hole right behind this guy's head is Amamun's forced entry. And this is actually where the main entrance is. Like I said, it's just off to the left. It's, uh, he, he, he went in dead center and thought he was going to hit something, but the actual passage is off left 286.1 inches. Um, <clears throat> this door that was originally on this uh, through the casing stones uh, was perfectly hinged. You could not even tell there was a door there. You had to know exactly where to push, and it would hinge this door. This door would just open up and hinge. Uh, it's, it's amazing. Here again is these uh, casing stones. Uh, the few that still left. Here you have a southwest uh, socket, a southeast socket, and these are showing us how the builders originally intended. Okay, here can see this is Adam Rutherford examining uh, lines inside the descending passage the upper part of the descending passage now if you look if you look behind him you see this vertical line it's, it's running perpendicular to this passageway and he's examining one right in front of him. You can't really see that line well, but this is the scored lines. These are the scored lines that point to Alcyon and the Pleiades. Then you have the granite plug that's blocking the ascending passage. And that's part of the granite plugs, the upper end where they had dug around them to get up past them. Right here. You're, you're looking into the queen's chamber, and, and if you look up, this goes up into the grand gallery. You're just coming out of the low ascending passage where queen's chamber goes straight off, and up, up here is the grand gallery. Now, this is the northern end of the grand gallery. You're looking down, looking down to where the, uh, you're looking down into the the low ascending passage this is the the grand gallery here's the great step they've got uh, bars so you can climb up it it's around like i said 30 i think it's 35.76 inches around three foot uh from here to here here's the top of the great step looking into the uh, antechamber or map room and then further on into the king's chamber there and here you're closer looking into the antechamber you can see the the uh, round cuts in the the ceiling of the antechamber that's where that's at and on back in here is the the king's chamber here you have the empty coffer now like I said before the volume inside that coffer is equal to exactly the volume inside the Ark of the Covenant. The volume inside this whole room is equal to the volume inside the Holy of Holies. It's just, uh, it just blows you away. I cannot, cannot get over the amazing details in this monument. Now, I'm going to bring you back to me. There you are. Okay. <clears throat> I hope you enjoyed this uh, expose on the Great Pyramid. 
I uh, hope you can see that this is a God-inspired monument that uh, was, was meant to, to call to our attention the Christ that was to come. Uh, and, and through all the ancient cultures, they all, they all pointed to a Messiah that were to come. And, and the reason being is this knowledge was going on way back then, and it was passed down. But what most people don't, don't realize and don't want to think about is, well, how could God speak through Egypt, through a pyramid or something like that? But uh, the fact is he did. And the fact is the Bible says he did. Uh, the, the Bible points to the Great Pyramid. This is not something created by man. This is something designed by God uh, or, or the plans given to Enoch maybe. Maybe Enoch was the actual architect or maybe he came and, and built this thing. Uh, who knows? The, the, he at least designed it because his fingerprints are all over it. Uh, and there's, there's a lot, a lot more. Uh, these are only the basics. These are the basic facts of the Great Pyramid. Uh, so think about these things and um, keep walking in faith, knowing that uh, our God's in control of everything. You know, his word will not fail. Uh, you've got God's uh, word in, in his word, uh, the written word. You've got God's word in stone in the Great Pyramid. Uh, I'll do a letter eventually or another podcast on Stonehenge, God's word in stone in Stonehenge. And probably sooner than that, I'll do the, the gospel and the stars. Now, that's a deep subject in itself, but all these things point to the fact that uh, man is without excuse. You can, you can uh, throw out the Bible and call it mere literature, but you cannot deny scientific facts. You cannot deny math. You cannot deny um, uh, that somebody with a great, great intelligence uh, created these things, created Stonehenge, created um, uh, the Great Pyramid, and also designed the Gospel and the Stars. The, the star names are the consistent throughout the world. The, the name itself may be different for a uh, different language. However, the meanings re uh, retained by those names are the same. Uh, and, and it all tells the Gospel message, folks. Um, Christ is the Messiah that was to come. He did come. He died. He got resurrected. And he's calling men unto himself. Uh, truly, mankind is without excuse. And, and this is God's one of God's great I told you so's to this world in these last days. You all have a great blessed day. And we'll, we'll talk again.